on this episode of the Oklahoma Breakdown with Hacker and Layman, presented by River Wind Casino. Andy Staples from On3 joins us to talk all kinds of college football. OU in the SEC, the future of college football, the college football video game. We get into everything with our guy, Andy. Please download and subscribe to the podcast. Rate it five stars and write us a good review. Follow the show on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. Just search Oklahoma Breakdown on any of those, and you'll find us. All right, our man Michael Hostie will kick this thing off. It's time for the Oklahoma Breakdown. It's a beautiful Wednesday, June 12th. And you're listening to the Oklahoma Breakdown with Actor and Layman, presented by Riverwind Casino. Riverwind is Oklahoma City's premier casino experience, and there are so many reasons why Riverwind is consistently voted OKC's number one casino, but it all starts with their amazing variety of gaming thrills and excitement. Riverwind's beautiful, award-winning environment plays host to more than 2,800 of the latest electronic games, with a huge selection of table games, including Blackjack, Blackjack Match Roulette, and Teddy's favorite, craps no matter what your game riverwind has it in spades and hearts and to learn more about their gaming promotions and entertainment options in the month of june all you got to do is visit riverwind.com riverwind casino simply the best now ted we are we're recording this well in advance we've got some vacations that we're on how do you think it's going for us how do you think Uh, future future ted's doing amazing tan and Ooh, yeah man. rest nice. well rested i think it's going good uh if we have missed anything if we have if we don't talk about any type of significant development on this episode it's because we recorded it way in advance because we were going on vacation i promise once we get back we'll talk about it if we missed it i, I think that's a fair way of saying it ted that's right that's right we'll hit it but we've we've got Andy Staples who does he does such a great job uh, of covering college football and let's go with all of its complexities currently. <laughs> yes. So let's get right to it. Here's here's our guy Andy Staples. It is our pleasure to be joined by a man that does a tremendous job covering college football for on three. Andy Staples is in the house. Gosh, you look fit, man. You just look better and better every time I see you. I'm just trying to keep up with you. Uh, it's, it's all of you guys, like you and Teddy, and then like Dusty is incredible. Like you forget Dusty played D line. We had a like I, I did a segment with Dusty one day on, on Sirius, and uh, you know we can all see each other on the Zoom when I joined by by Zoom the people watching or the people listening can't see it. They, they still don't put that on video like most of us do with our podcast. But I can't remember why Dusty wound up taking his shirt off, but he actually did the interview shirtless. And I'm like, yeah, good Lord. How, how did you ever get big enough to play D-line Oklahoma as shredded as you are now? Dude can eat. Hey, it comes out every now and then. It's the same with Gabe. Like, T- Tiger gets out of the of cage. Weight. Every yeah. once in a while, Tiger gets out of the cage. It's fine. I Gabe just Gabe, the story you told me about anyone I've seen. The story you told me, Gabe, about I, I forget which team you were you were playing for, but Thanksgiving uh, dinner where you had to weigh in. That that's the the, uh, to, the old Eric dinner. Wood Buffalo Bills tradition. <laughs> you weigh in at the at the front front end of Thanksgiving dinner and weigh out as you walk out the door. Tremendous. Absolutely. Now there's a lot to cover. Man, with everything going on in college football, and, and we'll get to the court cases and all that stuff. But I, I, I did want to talk about OU heading in the SEC first. I, I, I feel like expectations for this team are all over the board, depending on who yeah. you're talking about. What, what are your expectations for the Sooners in year one in the SEC? That Oklahoma is pretty good, but probably not competing for the sec title that's like i, I still think there's a chance oklahoma's competing for a college football playoff berth because i like the idea of oklahoma not being good doesn't compete with me like when the vegas win totals came out it was six and a half and they got bet up to seven and a half and, and it kind of stuck at seven and a half i'm like that still seems really low we're talking about oklahoma people like they're never bad so 
eight wins, nine wins, that's kind of where I, I would see this team. I don't know that I want to be rebuilding my offensive line my first year in the SEC. And let's be real here. The SEC uh, did not do them any favors with this schedule. There are some SEC teams that got pretty favorable draws. Ole Miss, Missouri, Tennessee. Oklahoma is not one of those. Oklahoma, Florida, Georgia, they got pretty rough draws. Yeah. Well, I, the the offensive line is definitely going to be a question. What What are your thoughts on Jackson Arnold? You saw him a little bit last year, came in the BYU game, um, performed pretty well, and then took over for the bowl game. I mean, I'd say a lot of their success is going to rest on how he performs. W what have you seen? I mean, his ceiling looks incredibly high. And, and look, you don't let Dylan Gabriel walk unless you are very confident that Jackson Arnold is that guy. And, you know, there were flashes in the bowl game where you're like, oh, I see exactly what they're talking about. And then there were times when he looked like a true freshman who was, who was playing, you know, for the first time as, as the guy. And I just, I don't know necessarily what we take, with, take from that because I, it's one game. And it was one game against a really good team that was like Arizona at that point was maybe the hottest team in the country. So I, I've got faith that Jackson Arnold is going to be pretty good. And I think that, you know, he was the guy that if you talk to coaches around the country last year, he was their, all of their favorites in that class among the quarterbacks. That's the guy that if they could have gotten anybody in the class, that's who they would have wanted. And so I think that's pretty telling. I think they're going to be fine there. Defensively, this is the deep as Oklahoma has been on defense in a long time. So I, again, I just, how does the offensive line hold up? And, and that determines what happens in games like Texas and that turns in, you know, Ole Miss, Alabama. And those are the games that we're talking about here. Like if you can win one of those games, you're competing for a playoff spot. Looking at the adjustment period for OU, what do you think, what do you think the biggest adjustment is going to be for the program? Like it, what, maybe what do you think will, I don't want to say catch them off guard, but is, is there anything that you think could surprise OU the most as they head into the SEC? I don't think anything's going to surprise Brent Venables. I, mean, I think Joe Castiglione's done his homework from an administrative standpoint about what they, what they need to be. I actually think, Oklahoma has known what it needs to do to be competitive in the SEC the, old, the whole time because Oklahoma has been trying to be competitive for national titles. Oklahoma just hasn't been able to pull it off yet. And it's really, it's just being good and deep on both lines of scrimmage. And I, I, like, I always go back to what Barry Switzer said in 2013. He's like, where are the Gerald McCoys and the Tommy Harris's? Why are, why are there no Gerald McCoys squatting down there? And like maybe maybe David Stone is that guy, but that's what Oklahoma has to have. You cannot be competitive in the SEC without that. And Oklahoma has been very deficient on the defensive line for, I mean, really since Jerome McCoy left. Well, I I think there's a lot of truth to that. Um, I think it's interesting. Uh, you mentioned if they win one of the Alabama Ole Miss games, they'll be, you know, right there competing for a playoff spot. I kind of see it as there's like Georgia is on a tier by theirself. And then you've got Alabama, Tennessee, Texas, Oklahoma, Ole Miss, Missouri. I'd kind of mash those teams together as, I mean, there's some, there's see, some but difference it's there, interesting. but they can all kind of beat one another, I feel like. I, well, Teddy, I think because we saw Oklahoma beat Texas last year saying that, but Texas, I would put Texas on the tier with Georgia from a roster standpoint. But like I just said, we saw Oklahoma beat them last year, which is why I don't believe in this seven and a half Oklahoma win total. Like, I'm sorry. I, I don't buy that because te uh, Texas was a very deep stack team last year. I think they've they've stayed that way. Like they, they they seem to have figured out how to overcome some of the stuff that was holding them back. Like they're developing players much better now. Uh, they're winning game. They're not losing the games that they shouldn't lose. Like 
Texas OU is a game that there's no should win. Like both teams go in there with a chance to win. So that's, I would say that give, that would give me more confidence for Oklahoma because I do think, I think Texas and Georgia are on a different plane roster. And I think Alabama probably is too. Like I, I saw Alabama in the spring. Their roster is as deep as ever. You know, it, they lost Caleb Downs, yes, but they replaced a lot of what they lost pretty well through the transfer portal. Caleb DeBoer brought, brought some guys in from Washington. They're going to be very helpful to them. And then the guys they had were pretty spectacular. Like, this is, is going to be a good offensive line. Alabama's going to run the ball really well. And we'll see how some of these receivers develop. They have a freshman named Caleb Odom, who they recruited as a tight end. He gets to campus. He's like 6'4", 225. He's just burning people. And they're like, nah, we're going we're gonna to make you a receiver. And they're, they're really excited about him. So I, I do think it's kind of those three from a roster standpoint at the top and then everybody else. But if you are, and this is the thing, Georgia, Alabama, Texas, Ole Miss, Missouri, Tennessee, LSU, Oklahoma, all of those programs expect to go 10-2 and two and make the college football playoff. At most, four of them are going to make it. Yeah, and I think that's why – that's what's going to make the SEC so much fun, right? This 16-team format, and we'll see. Maybe it ends up expanding more here in the next couple of years, Andy. But do you – what do you think the adjustment period for fans is going to be like? Because I – I feel like it's going to it's going to be more like a mini NFL where you you're, you're going to take some losses. It's going to be yeah, really really hard for for a team to go undefeated in this league. Like what what do you think the adjustment period is going to be for some fans where they're like, "Wait, wait, wait, wait. No, we're used to winning all the games." Yeah, you you're, you're going to have to you're going to have to accept that 9 and 3 in some years is really good. And and 9 and 3 may get an SEC team in the playoffs some years. Like that's, there are going to be years where your schedule is just stacked. And like, this is, uh, this is what, the, the way Oklahoma's plays out, like having Tennessee come to Norman for their first conference, for, for Oklahoma's first SEC conference game, and then having to go to Auburn is, that's about a, as, as good of a baptism as you're going to get. Because, like the Tennessee people are wild and crazy. And and you've seen that because they, you know, Tennessee and Oklahoma played a home and home not long ago. So you guys have seen them in action. They're a lot different now because they're a lot better now than they were during that that home and home with Oklahoma. But that's gonna be fun. Like when 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 the big orange caravan rolls into uh to Norman, it's gonna be quite a party. And I I'm you know, Oklahoma fans. Y'all are kind of a whiny cheese crowd compared to the uh, the a lot of the big SEC fan bases. So, and I know I know they never want to hear that. Nobody ever wants to, wants to hear their whiny cheese crowd, but you absolutely are, and you'll see it when you go to places like Auburn and LSU. I think the hope is, I our home schedule has been so horrible for so yes. long yeah. that I think I actually think that you know, and we've already seen like. Our, our three, our first three, I, and throw in the Texas game, we've got four kickoff times right now. Yep. Two, six, like a six, a 6.30, and two 2.30s. Yep. I, we've had we've kicked off at 11 a.m. for like seven or eight games the last like five seasons. Yeah, being, being one of the best teams in the conference and your conference having a deal with Fox, like you're going to have to play a lot of noon games, uh, noon right. Eastern, 11 a.m. local. Like, that yeah, changes you're, the demographic of your crowd to, to it, a do, it does. Does it does it change them a little it more time to get lubed up properly? But yeah. I, I will point out that an Auburn game at at 11 a.m. Central, an LSU game at 11 a.m. Central, they get lubed up pretty good too. Um, they they don't make excuses, but they uh, th this will be a lot more fun. This way, and a lot of it's it, the opponents coming in, like Tennessee will be a massive event. Alabama will be a massive event. But even South Carolina coming is going to be fun. You see something a little different. And that would have been like our South best Carolina, home game last year. South Carolina would have been our best home game last year. Yes. Yes. And now, and this year, it's, it's what, the, the fourth best? <laughs> yeah. 
We'll get you back to the interview, but first, Love's Travel Stops is now offering a nationwide 10 cent per gallon discount on gas and auto diesel. Just download the Love's Connect app and scan your barcode at the prompt on screen and watch that price drop 10 cents per gallon. Across the country, the Love's Connect app unlocks exclusive deals and can help any traveler plan their route or meal on the highway. So before you hit the road, be sure to download the Love's Connect app to save 10 cents per gallon and experience the country's best highway hospitality at Love's Travel Stops. Love's also has you covered if you forget your phone charger or headphones with their expanded mobile to go zone. And of course, don't forget to grab yourself some of that delicious Java Amore. And celebrate with a Schooner All-American Ale, the official craft beer of OU Athletics from Coop Ale Works. Named after the iconic Sooner Schooner that races across Owen Field after an OU score, you can join in on the celebration with an ice-cold beer from Coop Ale Works. You can enjoy it at the Palace on the Prairie, at OU Athletic Events, at the bar, at the tailgate, and in the comfort of your own home. For more information on Schooner All-American Ale, visit schoonerale.com. Must be 21 to purchase. Please drink responsibly. Scooter All-American Ale, the taste of game day. And we love Simple Modern. Simple Modern is an Oklahoma-owned drinkware company and number one drinkware sales leader on Amazon and Target. This summer, Simple Modern launched its summer shop where they drop new and unique drinkware options every other Tuesday all summer long. Now you can get your own limited edition version of their extremely popular 40-ounce treks in designs you won't see anywhere else. And even better, Simple Modern exists to give generously, donating 10% of all profits. So you can know you're helping better Oklahoma and beyond with every purchase. Check out the Summer Shop and all their amazing products at simplemodern.com. All right, back to the interview. So it's a new world. It's a new world for the suitors in the SEC. So I saw that you're back in the rankings game. I thought you... Yeah. I thought you swore off top 25s, but I saw a post-spring top 25 from Andy Staples. And then, then I saw you had OU at 24, mm-hmm. a, a little lower than the other ones I've seen. I'm see, I think I've seen them as high as 13 and one. They're kind of 15 to 18 in most of them. Yeah. But did you, did you put USC at 22 and Oklahoma State at 23 right in front of OU just to, just to <laughs> really, really poke the bear with this fan base? Was that intentional? Oklahoma State Staples? I did. I definitely did for Oklahoma State because they beat you last year. But oh, fair enough. And, and, and they bring back Dr. Alan Bowman for, for year number 94 in college football. Uh, no, the USC one, I did not, I, I, this, you mentioning it now is the first time I've even thought of, oh, wait, I did put Lincoln Riley ahead of them, but it's, it's me actually having some faith in Lincoln Riley, Lincoln Riley's intelligence for lack of a better term, like, cause here's, what's going to happen with USC. Either Lincoln Riley is going to figure out how to run a practice in November. Like he's going to talk to the the 75th analyst at Alabama or Georgia and be like, how do you guys practice? Oh, okay. Maybe we'll just do that. Or he's going to keep doing what he's doing. Their defense is going to stink and they won't be ranked at all. And they might, I mean, shoot, they might miss a bowl game if they're not, if they stink on defense against the schedule they have this year, it's going to be ugly. But I don't think he's that dumb. Like, I don't think he would do that. I guess time will tell on that one. I it, it is interesting though. The new form it's gonna we got a lot of new things this year. SEC scheduling and obviously with two new teams, the Big Ten scheduling there. Plus we've got the twelve team playoff. I I I don't know. Is it gonna be chaos or is this gonna be something where people look at it and say this is finally what we've been waiting for? Everybody who's complained about the possibility of this over the years is going to feel incredibly stupid when this starts because it's going to be awesome. Like the games in October and November are going to be so much more meaningful and not just in the SEC, but like think about the big 12, like the big 12 is going to have probably six or seven teams that are legit in the conference title race in late October, early November. Those games are going to be awesome. They're going to be so much fun. Uh, we were just talking about all the teams in the SEC that think they should make the playoff. Well, they're all playing each other. Like, they're all playing each other in October, November. Like it's going to be amazing. How how strange is it going to be not seeing Nick Saban 
on Bama's sideline. I, I guess we're going to see him on game day, so we're still going to see him. That's going to be weirder. <laughs> like seeing him at the desk. I, I just it, it is going to be weird. I, I think Kalen DeBoer is going to do a good job taking over for him. I think he's got he, he's gone in there understanding kind of okay, this is the pressure of the job. I realize where I'm at. I realize the expectations national title are bust, but I don't think that bothers him that much. I think he's fine with that because I, I think he wants to compete for national titles. And I see what he's done so far. I think I don't think they drop off. But the the part with no Saban is just it's bizarre because he's been he's been this thing that looms over the sport. Like every offseason, I'd get asked, what does it mean for my team if Nick Saban were to retire? And this like goes back 10 years. Now we've seen it. And like it, it has changed the math. It's changed the expectations at like an old miss. And like almost doesn't even play Alabama this year. But Nick Saban not being at Alabama changes where they feel their ceiling is. Well, I, I think what's interesting about that, and I agree, I think Alabama, they're going to be really talented. And I think DeBoer is probably going to do a really good job. It's going to be different. I mean, he has to make it his own to some degree. But I guess what I'm curious about is, you know, public perception can be, it can be a, a big swing in one way or the other. I think public perception with Nick Saban as their coach has been like one of the best things for Alabama that you could ever have. Just everyone that watches college football knows that that program, you're going to be developed. There's all these things that come with it with Saban as your coach, and he's not there anymore. So I even, I guess what I'm asking is if they drop a game or two, is like the groundswell of people going to say, oh, Saban's not there anymore. It's going to be different. Is that going to change kind of how everyone has perceived that program and create something that he's got to deal with in recruiting and, and transfer portal? Yeah, I don't think they're going to be viewed as invincible unless they just keep winning at the same clip that he did. Like, you have to go 11-1 to do that. I don't necessarily think they're going to be viewed as invincible every single season, but I don't know that I actually don't know that they were viewed as invincible in the very last part of his time there either, because I think Kirby smart and Georgia had taken that spot. Like they are now viewed as the top program in the sec and kind of the top program year and year out in the country. So that, that baton had really already been passed, but absolutely it's something that Kayla DeBoer's going to have to deal with in recruiting because Nick Saban could, could, there's a, we call it the Saban discount. Like with NIL, you didn't have to give the biggest bag if you're Alabama because Nick Saban could say, look at how many first rounders I've made. Look at how you'll get paid on the back end of this thing. Like we don't have to pay, overpay you as a freshman. We don't need you because there's somebody else who come play for me because look at how many first rounders I made. Uh, I'm, I'm interested with something you said about Georgia and kind of how it applies to OU. Like Georgia, and I agree. They are, they're viewed as the top dog in the sport right now with what Kirby's built, uh, the consistency that they've had. You, you talk to all kinds of different people uh, in college football. You talk to all kinds of different people that cover college football. How is Oklahoma football viewed right now? Like, what what's the program's reputation? I'm sure Venable's reputation, how people view him, is is mixed into all of that. But, like, what's... What do you think the overall view of OU football is right now? I think within the sport, like people who work in the sport probably have a, be a like a more positive general outlook than, than the general fan does. Cause I like, again, because I, I do this for a living. I cover this for a living. Like hearing people think Oklahoma is going to be average going to the sec does not compute with me. Oklahoma is never average. Like Ohio state is the one program that has never had a down period. Oklahoma is a close second in terms of just they, they're not down ever. They're always good. And I think people who work in the sport understand that. I don't know that the average fan understands that. They, they just look at, oh, well, they've been in the Big 12. They're moving to the SEC. It's going to be a very steep hill to climb. No, Oklahoma has figured out whether they've been in the Big 8, the Big 12, how to be the best, one of the, either the best or one of the best teams in the league. 
they're going to figure that out here too. Like that is just how they operate. I think one of the interesting things that Oklahoma fans want to like are curious about is, you know, whenever you compare Oklahoma and Texas, the two programs really aren't close on, on almost any metric. Um, Oklahoma's dominated over the, over the last 15 years. The recruiting is about the same. Oklahoma will be slightly ahead. Maybe Texas will be slightly ahead. A lot of similarities there. And I, I think what Texas win the big 12, maybe four, three or four times the entire time they were in it. Oklahoma's won at 14, you know, even like the best seasons that Texas has had over the last 10 years, Oklahoma beat them in those years. Right. With their best teams. Yeah. And Texas has been so much more up and down. Why is the, why is the standard or I guess the expectation and the reporting on Texas so drastically different than it is Oklahoma. And it matters because. Because they have better players on the line of scrimmage right now. That's why. They have Kelvin Banks and you don't. They had they had Byron Murphy and Tavondre Sweat. Like that's why. Yeah. Yeah. That in Oklahoma beat them with it. Everyone will tell you that, but that's why they still lost to Oklahoma. Right. And well, Oklahoma had Tyler Guyton. So it's not like they had a first Oklahoma had a first round offensive tackle in that game, too. Uh, but that's why. It's it's because of where Texas is at right now. If Texas and Oklahoma were moving to the SEC three years, like when that was announced that they were moving to the SEC, we would be looking at Oklahoma as oh they're going to be fine. Texas can get their ass beat in this league. Like that's that's what we do. It's that Steve Sarkeesian has done a good job getting Texas in a good place right now. But yes, historically Oklahoma is the much better program. Like in recent recent like even when Texas was really good under Mac Brown. Oklahoma was consistently better under Bob Stoops. So you're you're absolutely and that's why I said that's what what I said before about Oklahoma is always going to figure it out. The only thing that would surprise me is if Oklahoma didn't figure it out. Cuz they they are consistently good. Texas is consistently up and down. So which I realize is is probably an oxymoron. But They've been historically inconsistent. That's just how how their program has gone. Oklahoma's has been historically consistently good. So, but right now, Texas has a really, really good roster. And so, yes, Oklahoma beat Texas last year. Oklahoma also lost to Kansas last year. Texas made the playoff. Texas beat Alabama last year. Like, those all count too. So, Oklahoma has to show in those other games that they belong in this, this conversation as well. I think they're going to show that, but if you just compare rosters right now, compare who's going to get drafted where next year, Texas is, Texas is a pretty good spot relative, not just Oklahoma, but almost anybody. Yeah. I, I think it's going to be fascinating to see, you know, these first three years for both programs in the league and just kind of what it looks like. We'll get you back to the interview, but first. All you grill masters, listen up. Didier Ranch delivers quality beef that is 100% raised in Oklahoma right to your front door. Go to DidierRanch.com, D-I-D-I-E-R Ranch.com to order one of their premium quality beef boxes and use promo code Oklahoma15 for 15% off your order. Filet, ribeye, New York strip, sirloin, steak burgers, they've got it all, and they ship anywhere in the continental U.S., and Oklahomans can get deliveries in just one to two days. The only thing better than having a lot of premium beef on the O&D line is having premium beef delivered right to your front door. Didier Ranch, tradition tastes better. And head to the garage for hand-smashed patties, butter, toasted buns, and some ice-cold beer. It's the perfect spot to watch any big game, and with all garage locations being open at 10 p.m. or later every night, it is the go-to late-night spot. you got to get the Bison Burger, people. It is so good. Visit eatatthegarage.com to find a location near you and order online from the garage in your neighborhood. Attention business owners, you need Insurica in your life. Insurica is one of the country's largest insurance brokers with 30 offices throughout Oklahoma, Texas, 
in the Southwest. Insurica is able to customize programs by accessing the latest information from many insurance carriers. They compare and contrast coverage offerings and pricing in order to design a cost-effective, comprehensive program to meet your business's specific needs. If your business partners with Insurica, you'll save huge amounts of money and take back control of your total cost of risk. If your business wants to be best in class, connect with Insurica at Insurica.com. That's I-N-S-U-R-I-C-A.com. All right, back to the interview. Now, we, we got to transition to a conversation about the future of the sport. Because whenever mm-hmm. I get to have you on the podcast, whenever we get to talk to you, we we like to have you explain court cases to us because you're really good at at, at writing about those things and explaining them on your podcast. So let's do it like we're five years old, okay? <laughs> House first NCA, the case gets yep. settled. Why is it such a big deal? What's it mean for college football? Just g- give us give us the main bullet points we need to know because we're big dumb football guys. So House versus the NCAA was former athletes suing the NCAA saying, hey, NIL should have been allowed by you, but you were colluding, the schools, the conferences, you were all colluding to keep the money away from us. So you owe us money. And that one was settled along with several other kind of similar cases that were all in the same district, in the Northern District of California. And basically what they decided is they're going to set the the NCAA and the power conferences, which are the defendants in the case, they decided they're going to settle for $2.7 billion in back pay. So the NCAA national office and then the schools, and not just the power conference schools, but all of the schools are going to put the bill for all this back pay, which is a ton of money, $2.7 billion. But also... For the next 10 years, schools that opt in, which will be at least the ACC, Big 12, SEC, and Big 10, can share up to 22% of the average revenue of a power conference school, average athletic revenue of a power conference school. They can share up to 22% with their athletes. So it's the first time the NCAA is saying that schools can pay the athletes. So that's... If you want to just boil it down to one sentence, the NCAA is saying the schools can pay the athletes, which is something that 20 years ago, if you'd have told an NCAA person in 2024, you're going to settle a case and the schools will pay the athletes millions of dollars. They would have said, absolutely not. No way. That'll never happen. But it's happening. It's happening. Now, what's interesting is this, this settlement they hope is a way to create a salary cap. They're not going to get what they want. What they're hoping is this is a this is a framework, and then Congress will step in and give them an antitrust exemption that allows them to, to unilaterally impose a salary cap without negotiating with the players. The way they did this is, and, and the, the plaintiff's attorneys actually kind of worked with the schools on this, If you want the money that's being shared by the schools, you've got to opt into the settlement. So let's say you're an athlete who signs next year. If you want to get that money, you've got to opt into the settlement, which says, if if you opt in, I won't sue my school or the NCAA for imposing a salary cap on me. And what they're hoping is that all the athletes opt in, which essentially makes any sort of class action thing impossible. Because there's not enough, there wouldn't be enough people to to create a class to sue. And so that's how they're hoping to eliminate the lawsuits. I don't think that's going to work. I think there will still be people who sue. There will still be courts who want to review that case. It didn't settle anything in the court. I mean, they settled it amongst themselves, but it wasn't settled by the court. So that's the, that's the thing. They think this is a salary cap. They're wrong. Like, if you think it's going to make collectives go away, it's not. Like, some of them are going to kind of come in-house. But for football, like, at, at Oklahoma, at Texas, like at Georgia, a, at all the schools we're talking about. on the institution, not on the player, kind of, right? Correct. Yeah. Like, they're still going to use NIL money to supplement, and it's still not going to be real NIL. Like, it's not going to be because you did a commercial. Now, you can get those commercials, too. But they're going to make sure the players are paid their market value as players. 
Like they, they, the NCAA still plans to have rules against pay for play. That's complete bullshit. We know it. Like we know that the players are being paid for their abilities players. Now the schools are doing that. They want to do that. They're going to keep doing that. I, I guess what I'd like to know is how does it affect other sports? For a long time, they've, the, the talk has always been, we got to carve football out from the le- rest of the athletics because it's really the only consistent revenue producer. Like some mm-hmm. basketball programs at a handful of places actually are, are in the positive, but most of them are not. And that's kind of for every other sport. It has th- is this a total carve out? And how does that, how does all that all work? It's not a carve out right now. We don't know yet how it's going to work, how they're going to divide it. Because it, like the Title IX question hasn't been answered. Uh, Jeffrey Kessler, who was one of the lead attorneys for the plaintiffs in the House case, got asked about Title IX. He's like, well, the courts are going to have to decide that one. So he's basically saying people are going to sue over this and then some judge is going to decide. And that's all going to have to get worked out. The ADs have been saying, well, if you make us do this, we're going to cut sports. That's a complete scaremonger tactic. Uh, if you're an AD who cuts a sport, it's because you didn't care enough to raise the money to, to support it. Now, are there going to be coaches in other sports that don't make money that make less money now? Yes. Like Now, Patty Gasso at Oklahoma deserves every penny she gets. But I don't think there's a lot of softball coaches that need to be get, making 750 grand a year. Sorry. Like your sport makes no money. Like you don't, you, you you don't get the right to complain about not getting paid like the football coach. So like it, that's the part that I think that they're going to have to to grapple with. Like they've been building these palatial facilities and paying you know ever increasing salaries to the coaching staffs in these sports that make no money. Like don't do that. It's a waste of money. Like they don't. There's no return on investment there. But that doesn't mean you can't sponsor those sports. That doesn't mean you can't support those athletes. You just don't have to give them gold-plated things because the football players were making that money in the first place, and they should be getting it. You were you were a walk-on at Florida, and I keep seeing headlines about the possibility of walk-ons going away in college football. I just, I just don't believe it. Yeah, I, I, I don't just... think that's going to happen. It So the House settlement, and, and I'm glad you brought this up, Gabe, because I do think this is important to to talk about. They're eliminating scholarship limits, but in place of those, they're going to have roster caps. Like your ro- like in an NFL cap, you can't. You got fifty three players. You can't have more than fifty three players. And the coaches are worried that they're going to cap the football rosters at eighty five, which you've been running with 110, 120 man rosters. That would be a drastic change. Also, unlike the NFL, you can't sign somebody off the street. Like what you got is what you got. And so I, they're worried, yes, that, that a walk-on spot would go away because all, you would only – like you're going to scholarship all of your football players. If they say you can have 90, 90 football players, you're going to scholarship them all and try to get the best 90 you can, which would eliminate recruiting of walk-ons or the ability of, of someone who just appears on your campus to walk on a football team. I don't think that has to happen. I personally don't think you can have college football without walk-ons. Like you can't have Texas A&M football without the 12th man. I'm sorry. It's part of what makes the sport great. And intelligent people can figure out a way to make it work. For example, you guys played in the NFL. You had practice squads. Why can't you have a practice? Like in the NFL, a practice squad player does not make the league minimum. They make less than that. They have less different rights and privileges than a guy on the 53 man roster. Well, what is that? If not a walk on versus a scholarship player, like you could have a practice squad, which would allow you to, to take walk ons to be your scout team. And you could have a situation, a mechanism where you could elevate somebody from the practice squad. From, from a practical standpoint, it wouldn't change anything about the way coaches run their programs. Like at practice, it wouldn't change anything. Like I would have been on the scout team. I would have never gotten elevated. Some of the dudes I played with did get elevated. Like would have would have gotten scholarships. But I don't think I, I really if they can't figure that part out, 
I don't have any faith in them to figure anything else out either. Like you got to be able to have walk-ons. And I just like, that's an idea I, I we, we talked about on the show this week. Like we came up with that idea in 30 seconds. They can figure it out. Well, I think it's good that it seems like all of the coaches are seem pretty uh, resolute in, in wanting to keep it. So I, I gather because of how they're, it was a settlement that we didn't get an actual ruling. So I, there's still a lot of gray area out there. I'm guessing you don't think this is going to be the final look college football that we have for any duration. It's there's still no gonna be change. Yeah. I, I think until they get to, to collective bargaining, it's going to be in flux. I think once they get to collective bargaining then they're, then the things are going to start to coalesce into rules that probably will stick for a long time because they can't be challenged legally. I mean, well, anybody can sue anybody over anything, but if you have a real CBA, then the the legal challenges aren't going to hold up. So those are rules that can stick, but you had another court case that got settled on Thursday. The NCAA essentially waved the white flag on transfers. You know, they're being sued by various states and by the justice department and basically said it, it's funny because I, I think the justice department was probably being charitable and allowing them to call this a settlement. Basically NCAA quit. Like <laughs> as Nick Saban would say, make his ass quit. Like that's, they quit. And, and I think they had to because they're in these other cases where they're trying, like the schools do not want the players to be employees. That That is sort of the hill they've chosen to die on. And you can't enforce non-competes on people that you are in other courts saying are not employees. Because that's the first question you're going to get. Like, okay, well, have you thought about making them employees if you'd like to enforce these non-competes? And they'll go, well, we don't want to do that. And then the, the judge will go, then why are we even here? And that's why they've given up. But I think it's important because basically they've said there are no transfer rules. They're not going to make any more. They've agreed that they will never make them again. And if that's the case, the thing that drives this all the time free agency still exists. Like if you ask coaches, the ability for them to transfer unfettered is the bigger problem than NIL or anything else. Because the coaches don't really mind the guys being able to get money. What they mind is the guys coming in every six months going, I'm going to need a raise or I'm going to the portal. That would piss me off too. But right now, if you're not going to recognize them as employees, if you're not going to treat them as employees, you have no mechanism to hold them. And I think if you, if you ask the coaches, they would say, whatever it takes to get collective bargaining so I can sign a dude to a three-year contract. Let's make that happen. But right now the schools are not there yet. I I want I want to have the power that a college football player has right now, guys. That sounds awesome. Oh, I, there's I, never been a better time. I, I could never. just do whatever I want. That sounds yes. fantastic. Yeah. I, if I were the players, I wouldn't want to change a thing. I wouldn't want anything to ever change again. No. Go wherever you want, make money. Sounds fantastic. We'll get you back to the interview. But first, fellas, Father's Day is coming up on June 16th, and our friends at Manscaped have some excellent gift options for you to get your dad. Head over to manscaped.com and get 20% off plus free shipping with code OKBREAKDOWN. My dad's got a beard. He's had it my entire life. He needs a beard trimmer upgrade. Got to have it. So I got him the Beard Hedger Pro Kit. It's the complete beard maintenance kit for all the bearded dads out there. This all-in-one kit comes with a beard hedger. That's Manscaped's most advanced beard trimmer, as well as shampoo, conditioner, oil, and balm for his beard. It also comes with a brush, comb, and scissors so he can style his beard and mustache. This kit's fancy, y'all. It's fancy. Now, maybe your dad isn't blessed with a luxurious beard. Maybe you're like Ted Lehman over there, beardless. Well, you can get some of the Boxers 2.0. They were designed with a simple mission to make the most comfortable boxers using perforated performance fabric for extra breathability. Get 20% off plus free shipping with code OKBREAKDOWN at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use code OKBREAKDOWN. Happy Father's Day from Manscaped. 
and head to opolisclothing.com for our podcast merchandise and the best OU gear out there. That's O-P-O-L-I-S clothing.com. Use promo code TED, T-E-D, for 10% off. That's opolisclothing.com. Use promo code TED for 10% off. Buttery soft and 10% off. All right, back to the interview. Now, there is there is another ma- just massive, massive development in college football right now. And that is the return of the video game. Yes. You, you were one of the fortunate few that, uh, that got to play it early. I want to know everything. Andy, tell me everything. What, what, oh what let's start God. here. It, well, what, so what, I, I what did you down, like the it, most? Well, I, I'll tell you, I, so it, I can only say so much here or you guys, cause you guys have lives and have to get on with your lives at some point, but I did a video the other day when they finally allowed us to talk about this stuff. And I, I said to my producer, like, eh, we'll go for like 10 minutes. And I got done talking and I was like, oh, how long was that? He's like 33 minutes. <laughs> I was like, because oh. I was just trying to dump every piece of information out of my brain. It's really cool. So we've been waiting 11 years for this game to come back. And having met the people who make the game, I understand why it is the way it is because they are as, as college football nerdy as we are. Like they love this stuff. Like they, they figured out how all 134 bands in the FBS, well, like what formation they're in when the team takes the field. And it's perfect for every single school, like every single one. They try to make you feel like you're in the stadium. And like, cause I know people said, is it just like Madden? The gameplay, of course, is very similar to Madden. They, they run on similar engines, but the the experience of playing is very different than Madden. Because in Madden, you're just worried about the next play. You're not, you know, you're gonna skip past the replays, all that stuff. In this game, they've got a picture in picture while you're picking the next play because they're gonna be showing you the thing. Like if you're Oregon State and you pick off a pass, you got the turnover chainsaw. Like that's in the game. So it's they try to get all the little details, all the little quirks. And then the offenses are much more wide open. Obviously, it's a lot more diverse set of playbooks. It's much more fun to run the ball, I think, in this game than it is in Madden. Uh, one thing you guys I know will love, you can now change protections of the line of scrimmage. Yes. Half slide, full slide, max protect, you name it, it's all there. They're bringing Beautiful. the nickel. We're changing the protection, Andy. Let's go. You can, oh, you can re-ID the mic. What? Yeah. I'm going to have to buy a PlayStation. I don't think we have one. I, I think I'm going to have to purchase just to work See, on I'm my protection changes. I'm a 14-year-old son, so I, I, like, that's what everybody's like. When are you going to get a console? Like, we've had a console. Like, you you don't even want to know what we went through to get that PlayStation 5, that, that one Christmas that came out. So... I'm, I'm going to be screaming. My wife's going to be like, what is wrong? I'll be like, I missed the safety rotation, honey. I didn't change the protection. I did. I'm an, I'm an idiot. Another good thing. So depending on the attributes of your QB, if they have good pre-snap recognition, sometimes the game will give you some hints. Like it'll tell you they're in a cover four shell. Now that doesn't mean they're going to play cover four, but it means the, the game's going to give you a hint at what, what they might be playing. And but that's only if your quarterback is a veteran with good pre-snap recognition. Or if your team is one that has opted into the in-helmet communication, right? If, well, they've all opted into that. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, 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 that's something because the, they don't have the actual coaches in the game yet, which I, that, I think that's going to come next year. Like basically EA is afraid of the agents because they're, they're worried Jimmy Sexton is going to be like, I know Lane Kiffin said he would do this for free, but let's be real here. You got to pay for, pay to have Lane Kiffin. I don't I don't think they're gonna be that I don't like I don't think Jamie would do that. I, I actually think if the coaches want to be in the game and and they either want to do it for free or because they understand the the recruiting all it value takes of is it. one coach to do it for free and then everyone else is gonna be like, I've got yeah, to can't, it. We can't we yeah. can't let them but, have but I edge. think if you did that, like I would boost Ole Miss and I would boost Auburn, like to have Hugh Freeze being able to just tell the quarterback what to do, or to have Lane Kiffin be able to tell the quarterback what to do, I think that boosts boost their ability offensively so but you got speaking of coaches though you can be a coach in this game obviously dynasty modes back a lot of decision making portal versus recruiting out of high school like that is a big piece of the team building roster building 
aspect of it. And it's, it's very similar to what they have to do in real life. And so how you handle that will determine how successful you are as a head coach in dynasty mode. What was your absolute favorite thing you experienced playing it? Well, I did take UNLV to Clemson and ran a little go-go offense down the field. So they, here's another nerdy thing that I love. I, I think some people hate it just because it's different, but I love it because I think it makes more sense. So in whether you're running read option or triple option, uh, they've changed the mechanics of of the the first guy through. So it used to be that the default was you'd snap the ball. If you didn't press anything, the quarterback would keep. Like if you wanted to hand off to the first to, to the first guy through, whether it was the dive back on the triple or the back in the in the read option, uh, you would have to hit X really quickly. That they've changed that. Now the handoff is the default, which in real life, you're more likely to hand off. The pull is takes the button press. So you can you can you have a like an extra split second to read the unblocked defender and figure out what he's doing. And you could decide if you want to hit X and pull. And I, I had a lot of fun with that because like I was playing against Clemson. So obviously their D line was way better than my O line. So I had to, I had to read that guy accurately. Or I was getting splattered, but I got, I did have one drive where I got UNLV down the field against Clemson running the option. Did you get to mess with the play playoff format? Is is that in there? And is no, that we, cool? we can only do play now. So we didn't get a chance to do that. But in dynasty mode, you will get to see the playoff. And like uh, Ben Howe Miller, who's one of the guys in charge of the game, he's an FSU grad. And like when Florida State got left out of the playoff, he's in the slack going, all right, we need to adjust the decision-making engine in terms of how they pick the teams and how they seed the teams in the playoff. Because... We just saw something that they said would never happen, happen. So now we need to adjust the behavior of the committee for the CPU. Hmm. Those, those are things you just, you never, you never think about. So just last one for you, Andy, just how excited should people be about the video game? Because it seems everything I've heard from you and from a couple other people that got to play it, just, just over overwhelmingly positive reviews. They put so much care into this game, guys. I, I was, because this is the thing, everybody everybody goes, well, they're paying you to, to advertise. No, they're not. They don't have to. Like, this is, that's the crazy thing about this. They're getting so much free advertising out of this because people are so excited about this game. But the thing is, the, the double-edged sword is if the game had sucked, we're not getting paid. We would have told you it sucked. Like, it did not. It was awesome. And, and I think it's because they work so hard to immerse you in the world of college football. And I think if they had tried to rush this thing back to market, let's say, you know, because once, once NIL came into, into being, they could pay the players to be in the game. That was the thing that was holding them back from making it again. They probably could have put this out last year, but I don't think they would have been able to put it out the right way last year. I think it would have, they, they would have had too much work ahead of them. They would have had to cut a lot of corners. They didn't cut any corners here. They put it out the right way. It looks like college football. It, it you know, embraces the things that make college football cooler than the NFL. I just, I'm so excited for, for everybody to see it because, like, I had a lot of fun playing it. I am not a massive gamer, but this was the game I played when I played. And now the part that I think feels cool to me, I've got a 14 year old son. I do not get to be cool in his eyes very often. When I came back from EA sports, his spring, uh, his high school spring football game was that night. They, they played this, you know, much bigger team hung with them, ended up in a tie. Like everybody's all excited because they hung with this team that, that looked like they were going to kill him. The second I get to the locker room door to pick him up, there's kids coming out of the locker room going, God, tell me about the game. Tell me about the game. Tell me about the game. And I was like, I was like, oh man, this is a whole new generation. Like none of these, these kids were like four years old last time the game came out. They've never played it. They are going to love it as much as we always did. That's awesome. Well, it, 
dude, it's always so much fun catching up. Uh, I appreciate you explaining all the legal stuff that I feel like that was a tremendous explanation. We're, we're all, excited I don't, I don't know if I'm, if I'm doing a good job anymore. We've got a guy named Pete Nakos that works for us on three. He explains it to me and then I can help explain it to everybody else. Perfect. There's just a chain of explanation. Yeah. If you explain it to the people telephone that, that, that this, we're, we're, they'll we explain it, it to their friends. Yeah. We, we make it more digestible to the audience as we go. You're, there's going to be some guy talking to his buddy. Hey, what about a college football practice squad? Huh? <laughs> huh? No, you're, yeah, you're the exactly. man, Andy. Uh, I always appreciate the time, buddy. All right. Appreciate it, guys. Thank you so much. A lot of great stuff from Andy there. Uh, some really good ideas when it comes to the future of college football, but everything he said about the video game has me so fired up. I'm excited. I'm I'm right there in the window. I've got a nine-year-old that has recently started playing Madden, and I've been explaining to him what's coming, and he's intrigued, to say the least. It's going to be awesome. Uh, I, do, I do like the fact that Andy seems to be confident that Oh, you football is just going to keep being good. Cause yeah. I think we feel the same. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I, I think so. And, uh, I don't know the, the first, it, there's so much unknown. It's hard to, it's hard to stack yourself up against some of these other teams that we just, we don't have a history with. So that's, what's going to make this inaugural season. Awesome. On that note, episode 430 in the books. We'll have a new podcast that'll drop on Sunday. Just a reminder, please subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to podcasts and please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hope you all have a great rest of your week. Have an awesome weekend. Until next time, we appreciate y'all for listening and do what you always do, Oklahoma. Take care of each other.